The following is a Shaw TV public affairs presentation. Constituency Report is produced as a public service by members of the BC Legislature through the facilities of Shaw TV. Hello and welcome to Constituency Report on Shaw TV. I'm your host, Joanna Groves, and with us today is the MLA for Esquimalt Machosan, Mitzi Dean. Thanks for being here, Mitzi. Hi, Joanna. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Great. Um, so we're a few weeks into the new session. Can you tell me about some of the highlights so far? Well, again, it's been really exciting. We're doing a lot of work. We have a lot of le legislation that we're um, pushing through. And of course, we've had the budget as well. So I know we're going to talk more about the budget and about the benefits in the budget for people in Esquimalt we've chosen. On a day-to-day -day basis, again, it's really intense, um, the same as the fall session. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of great opportunities for me. The highlights are being able to stand up in the house and talk about things that I know are really important to my community. So it might be a two minute statement where I can stand up and talk about an event in our community or an agency in our community. Um, we have so many diverse um, activities and neighborhoods in our community, lots of different activities going on. So I always have a lot that I can talk about, that I can celebrate. Um, and there are key milestones coming up for different agencies and organizations. And uh, it's really great to be able to showcase that and share that with, um, with the house and you know, with, through that with British Columbians as well. And then I also stand up and, and talk in the house on issues as well. So um, we actually debated a motion around supporting gender equity which I know again we're going to talk about later but you know that's something that's really important and we can all talk about how can we as a government um, and how can the house actually support gender equity across so many different dimensions and so there are a number of um, different needs and issues that we're able to have debates around and uh, and have discussions about that I know have been really important issues for people in my community for so, so long. And it's such a privilege and an honor to be able to stand up in the house and speak about issues and about experiences that I know are impacting people still, even in my community. So for example, I was talking the other day about um, someone had been telling us at the constituency office about their ongoing issues about being able to access health services in the community and just getting a prescription refilled and uh, she actually had to go to three different walk-in clinics right and uh, so I was able to, to provide that as an example of the ongoing pressures that people still face that budget 2018 is going to address so that's the real highlight for me is still that aspect of service of standing in the chamber and talking about people who I know are examples of so many people in my community. Um, and of course, we have a lot of people who want, um, it, not, not people of, from my community, but people from across the province who represent different organizations, different interest groups who want to talk to us, mm -hmm. especially now that we're government as well. So part of the, a lot of the work that we do is actually listening to these different groups and hearing about them, of um, what their analysis is about what's been happening in our province over the past uh, you know, decade and more, and what an opportunity this is about how our government can actually make things improve for British Columbians as well. Yeah, it's exciting times, absolutely. Yeah. And I understand you recently took on a new role. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, well, I'm really thrilled about this. I'm the, um, I'm the Parliamentary Secretary for Gender Equity, um, and I've been working in the area of social services, social justice, uh, working on issues of domestic violence, sexualized um, violence as well for my professional career, so for 30 years. And so to be able to bring this to a provincial level is thrilling for me. Um, and I can see a lot of work that we can do as well. So I think even as we have a cabinet that is 50% women, illustrating how much progress we have made, we still have a long way that we can go. And so I've already been talking with colleagues, um, uh, you know, across government about um, what priorities we could be tackling to promote gender equity. So I think there are some systemic issues that we still need to tackle and address. I think there's also some uh, benefits and some solutions already captured within budget 2018. And then I think there's also some specific areas of programming that we know have been neglected. 
and that we need to um, make much more progress on. So, for example, um, looking at Budget 2018, there's some programmes in there provincially um, that will start to address some, some gender imbalances. For example, the minimum wage. If we think about um, the Fair Wages Commission and their work and the plan for increasing the minimum wage, that actually benefits women a lot because a lot of women are in lower paid um, sectors and part-time sectors yeah, as well. That's true. Yeah. And so, um, so, you know, actually looking at the minimum wage is something that has a particular gender um, dimension to it. And then also thinking particularly around programming for women, for example, so women um, who are experiencing domestic violence and mm -hmm. sexual assault as well. Um, we've, we've actually increased the budget to $18 million over three years oh, wow. to increase those programs, recognizing that that area of service provision has been neglected mm -hmm. and, uh, and w wasn't keeping up with the level of need for the past decade and a half. And we're making choices about making sure that vulnerable women in those situations receive the services that they need. And, and <clears throat> what's that gonna mean for, for women who find themselves in that situation? Well, it's going to mean that they've got um, easier and faster and earlier access to services. So that'll help them protect themselves, make safer choices as well. And it'll help with long-term recovery because that mm -hmm. will also um, increase access to counselling and recovery services too and being able to build safety plans mm -hmm. and long-term safety for the whole family as well. And also in the longer term, we're also going to be building more um, shelter space and refuge space for women and children too. So that will increase capacity and then what that will mean is we'll actually have more um, available capacity in times of emergency. Right. So immediate safety. You know, what we've seen over the past um, 16 years is that services have not kept up with the level of need and we've seen time and again preventable tra tragedies mm -hmm. in our community and we know that we need to invest in those services so budget 2018 is taking steps towards um, <clears throat> addressing that gap and we know that there's more that we can be doing as well so I'm really excited about looking across all ministries about more progress that we can make in a range of areas that will benefit gender equity. Well that's so exciting because it, it's such an important area and, and should yeah. receive some some attention for sure. I know that in Budget 18 one of the big priorities is housing. Can you tell the people at home um, what are some of the things that we're going to be doing and what they can expect to see? Well, this is amazing what Budget 2018 um, is bringing forward for the whole province because it's a 30-point action plan to address the housing crisis. And so, th so there's a whole range of strategies brought into this budget that are going to benefit British Columbians, benefit people all the way from Esquimalt to Machosan, who have a range of different needs and are facing different issues in this provincial housing crisis. So um, it's gonna actually tackle speculation in the market, <clears throat> as well as increased capacity as well. Um, and by increasing capacity, you know, hopefully liberating some um, currently existing stock that could be rented, um, as well as increasing affordable housing by investing in building and also investing in, in just increasing capacity as well. So I know from our community, I know, you know, from having spoken to people in, across our community for over 10 years, that housing is the biggest challenge for everybody. If, if, if I talk about youth, if I talk about young adults wanting to, you know, start to live independently, families, especially young families, and also seniors are all struggling to find appropriate housing that's affordable for them at that stage in life and, and where they're at as well. So. I knew of a lot of young people who were couch surfing. Of course, that puts them at risk. That's a huge security issue if they're, if they're mm -hmm. couch surfing. They don't know where they're gonna sleep from one night to the next. They get thrown out at 11 o'clock at night because something happens. Um, and then also a lot of young families were living in overcrowded situations because they couldn't afford um, to find appropriate housing for their families. Um, and again, that's it. the other issue for families in our community is that it's insecure and mm -hmm. it's unsafe and it's unstable and it's unhealthy. And so part of our 30 point um, strategy in budget 2018 is also making sure that the affordable housing stock is good quality as well. Mm -hmm. And so we need to be investing in that too. And, um, and so also investing in more affordable housing will actually increase that affordable housing stock, which will be really important for so many people in my community who just aren't able to afford housing and um, 
when you know I, I a, a single mum with three kids went to view a house to rent she was telling me um, just at the end of last year and 17 other families were there viewing that house and she knew someone, you know, obviously there'd end up being a bidding war. She knew she could only just even afford it at the rate that they were asking. And, uh, and, and of course, then that impacts all of her, the quality of life because of wanting to be close to a certain school, wanting a certain number of bedrooms, wanting a certain quality of, uh, of life and, and quality of house to be able to look after your family as well. Yeah. Right. And I know that with a college and two universities um, in the area, you have a lot of students in your in your community. Um, does this budget do anything for student housing? Well, that's the other great thing. Again, could have happened over the past 10, 15 years and didn't happen. And we've made the choice that we're going to enable universities to actually build student housing. And that is a, such a success story, you know, in, on so, in so many ways, because for students, um, you know, they want to live close to campus that will reduce their reliance on, on transit and, and, you know, adding to congestion. They need it to be affordable. They need it to be good quality. Um, you know, they need to be able to access supports as well. And then what that does is it takes them out of the, um, you know, the suites or you know some of the other options, and and frees up that capacity in the community as well. So it benefits the community, yeah. opens up another level, another sector of available accommodation across the whole of the community as well. So um, yeah, I'm really proud that our our government is actually moving forward on that plan for universities. Absolutely. Well, that just makes sense, I think. Um, I know and the other major priority for this budget is child care. Um, can, you, can you tell us more about that and how that's going to impact families? Yeah, well, child care, again, is another one of the huge issues in my community. So particularly in my community, um, I'm, I'm sure, you know, anyone listening to this will know about the Colwood crawl. And so many, many people from my community have to commute to work and they get stuck in congestion. Many families in my community have to commute to childcare before they are even commuting to work. And that's really stressful. It affects quality of life for families and it just increases the strain as well. And um, so, increase, so the investment of, of budget 2018 is historical. It's an historical investment in childcare. So that across the province, we know this is going to actually promote um, women's engagement in the economy, for example, and it's going to really support families as well. Because for many families, they, there's no choice for them, right? They, they don't have the choice of actually being able to access childcare or being able to find affordable childcare and also good quality childcare as well. So our plan and our strategy of supporting universal childcare actually is to ensure that childcare is affordable, also that it's accessible, so that means increasing capacity and that it's good quality. So mm -hmm. we're going to be encouraging um, unlicensed spaces to become licensed as well. And that will immediately help many families um, in, in uh, being able to make choices for them to be able to reconnect into work and get back into um, it being productive in the economy as well. Yeah, I know that a lot of families who are in childcare, they're spending a significant amount of their income on that, and the subsidies currently are, are very, very low. What can what can those families expect as far as um, sort of what's going, coming down the pipes quickly as far as the affordability? Yeah, well, we're actually bringing out um, a different system in terms of subsidies, so we're actually going to be able to make sure that these families receive some money that will offset those those costs, as you say, of childcare, which are like having a second mortgage. And um, for many families are not, they, they can't even make that choice. Mm -hmm. It's just not affordable for them to choose that. So we're bringing in um, very quickly um, a couple of range of options that are actually going to make those childcare fees much more affordable for families um, and then also increase choices as well. And I think that also there's a fee reduction program, is that correct, for, yep. for licensed care? Yep, yep, there's a fee reduction program as well, so that'll mean that it becomes more affordable for families. For all, yep. for all families, regardless for all families of, in of income Columbia. level. Yeah. Yeah. What's the reaction been like? Because I'm sure, I know that this is a huge issue in your community and across the province. Have you have you heard from con from your community members about? Yeah, well, people in my community are really excited about this. I've heard a lot of support around Budget 2018, particularly because people can actually see 
that for them, this creates a solution. It offers them some choice as well. And for so long, people in my community have felt they're on their own. They have felt really abandoned and neglected and that they've had to work really hard, pull double shifts to actually make things work. And now they're actually feeling like there's a government here that understands and a government that's offering programs that they can see on a, a paycheck to paycheck basis um, that actually these programs are gonna benefit them and their family directly, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So important. I, I know affordability is a huge thing for your community. Um, well, we, we have to go to a break, um, but uh, when we come back, we'll talk about some of the things that uh, you've been doing in your community, uh, not just as the, you know, the important issues. Um, we've been speaking with MLA for Esquimalt, Malt, Mitchosen, Mitzi Dean. Uh, I'm your host, Joanna Groves. Um, and if you if Mitzi is your MLA and you would like to get in touch with her, please get your pen and paper handy as we'll be broadcasting your contact details on your screen. And we'll be right back after a short break. Welcome back to Constituency Report on Shaw TV. I'm your host, Joanna Groves, and we've been talking today with the MLA for Esquimalt Machos and Mitzi Dean. Thanks again for being here, Mitzi. Thank you, Joanna. Great. So as I said before the break, um, we wanted to get to some of the things that you've been doing in your local community. Uh, we last spoke, I think it was at the end of October. Right. Uh, did you have a chance to get out, out in the community before Christmas? Yes, yeah, as soon as the, as soon as the house rose, it was, um, it was really satisfying to be able to spend some time in the community and reconnect with people. I know people had been waiting uh, patiently, you know, for a time that we could actually talk and catch up on things that had been happening in the community as well. Of course, um, in November, we had Remembrance Day. And um, of course, in um, Esquimalt, we have the base, um, CFB Esquimalt. And so that's a really important community event as well. And uh, a lot of people from the community come to that event. So I was really proud to be there in my new position as MLA for the first time this year. Yeah. And then, of course, leading up to Christmas, we have a lot of markets across the whole of my constituency. And um, and there's uh, Christmas parades as well. So I was I was invited to be one of the judges at the Esquimalt Christmas Parade. Um, so that's really good fun, and it's fantastic time to connect with people, and people are there with their families as well. And uh, so it, it's a lovely opportunity for me to be out and about in the community at all these different events, and uh, people are really interested in what have been happening in the house and the progress that the government have been making as well. Yeah. Great. And um, I believe you attended an event at Royal Roads, um, the First Nations Technology Council. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a, there's a photo up there, right there. Can you tell us a bit about that event? Yeah, well, that's really exciting. Um, that's a partnership with Royal Roads. Royal Roads, of course, is in Colwood um, and is a university in the heart of, in the heart of Esquimalt, my chosen constituency. And it's a real example of modern day partnerships about how um, people are working together and recognizing strengths together and, and looking forward as well. So building on innovation as well. Um, and uh, so I was really proud to be there because it's obviously in the constituency, but also it reflects so many of the values that are really important to me and also important to the government as well. So it's about respecting um, the strengths and the expertise that we have locally, um, also the innovation and the partnerships and recognizing um, the First Nation contribution there as well. Great. Um, did you hear about anything exciting that's coming up through the council? 
Well, um, they'll be releasing some information about their exciting plans, I'm sure. And the whole event was really good fun. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was really well organized. Um, uh, Shirley, Elder Shirley Alphonse was there and uh, and did a blessing. We had Lekwungen dancers there. And I, I had attended another event at Royal Roads where the witness blanket was displayed as well. Um, so I really appreciate and honor the work that's being done in the community towards reconciliation and making sure that we um, hold events and build relationships in a genuine partnership and, yeah. and, and uh, recognizing proper protocol as well. Absolutely. Um, and then I think a little bit later there was the Lunar New Year celebrations. You got right. to take part in that. Yeah. There you are, it looks like with a, with a couple of our cabinet ministers in the local MLAs, <laughs> yes. Rob Fleming and Lana Popham. Yes, yeah. So again, that's great to connect with that community as well. And we are really fortunate here on South Island. You know, we have the Premier, the Deputy Premier <laughs> and cabinet ministers as well. Yeah, no shortage. <laughs> yeah, right. And, uh, and I have so much respect for them and they're all working so hard as well. Um, so it's a real privilege for me to spend time with them and to be out in the community celebrating um, Lunar New Year as well. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a fun event, especially for families, I think. Yeah, yeah that's right. Of course, we were giving out little um, bags with candies in and posters <laughs> and visited the shops um, and, and the shopkeepers welcome us every year. And um, yeah, there was a, there's, it's, a, it's a lovely festival atmosphere. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And then um, there was a Stolen Sisters March that happened. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's a photo of you there with another cabinet minister, uh, local MLA, Carol James, mm -hmm. and it looks like one of our Victoria City councillors. Mm -hmm. um, tell me about that yeah. event, and I think there was also the, the Moose Hide yeah. um, well, campaign these are, march. Yeah, the Moose Hide campaign march as well as Stolen Sisters. These are really important events. They're very important um, moments of reflection as well as opportunities for education as well and what's really beneficial as well is being able to stand alongside um, you know people um, who are able to advocate as well so that we can talk about what solutions do we need how can we work together and showing that recognition and honor um, for the tragedies that have happened in yeah. our community. For, for those who aren't familiar with those events, um, can you give a, sort of an overview of what Stolen Sisters is all about? Yeah, well, the Stolen Sisters March is actually about honoring, but also um, advocating for justice for uh, murdered and missing um, average indi right. indigenous women and girls. Um, and of course, part of my new portfolio is going to be monitoring that as well. Um, and so it's really important um, that we take action and I know that the government will be reporting on um, what action that um, BC has been taking in that area as well and uh, the Musai campaign again is around actually making sure that we tackle that issue and is very much about men standing up alongside um, women and particularly indigenous women and communities to make sure that action is taken so that um, this issue is addressed. It's a, it's a, um, a tragedy that needs to be tackled. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, and also with um, our, our First Nations, I understand that you were at the announcement mm -hmm. of, uh, from the Songhees First Nation, mm -hmm. I believe. Mm -hmm. So what was happening in this photo and, and on that day? Yeah, so um, Songhees Nation have uh, collaborated and put together a proposal to host the North American Indigenous Games. So that's really exciting and um, I would, I'd be really excited to see it come here. And it's a fabulous collaboration as well. So across the whole of South Island, um, a lot of different authorities and interested people are working really hard together to try and make sure that this bid is going to be successful. Of course, it's in competition with other bids across North America and so we've been really, um, I know they've done all the work, they've been working really hard to showcase uh, why the games should come here as well. Yeah, and so there was a, a lovely ceremony of celebrating all the work that had come together and uh, marking the the process of actually putting forward that application, yeah. When are we going to find out about that, do you know? Oh, there are really short timelines actually, um, and uh, so I, I don't know exactly what the timelines are, but they're going to be coming along pretty quickly, we, yeah. because we need to know pretty soon because of uh, the games actually taking place in 2020, and um, I think that's right, 2020. Yeah, that's only two years. Right, <laughs> yeah, and so there's a lot of organization that's going to yeah. need to take place between the, now and then. Yeah. Well, well, we'll keep our 
fingers crossed and, and hope that that happens. Um, and uh, there was another event that you went to very recently um, that was the memorial for Dave Barrett. Um, right. Yeah, our premier from the 1970s. Um, yeah. there's, a, there's a photo here. Um, I know that I, I think a lot of people in, in Greater Victoria went to that. Can mm -hmm. you tell me, tell me about that? And um, for those that weren't able to attend, give them a, a little bit of a of taste of what. It was really moving. Mm -hmm. And really moving just to see who was there as well. So many um, people from the community, leaders of the community, who everybody had a story to tell about Dave Barrett and the, and the people who were paying their tributes as well. Everybody brought his sense of humor with them and, um, and, and his style and, and love and fondness and passion. And it was, so it was just so inspiring to hear everybody talk. And of course, all of the um, achievements that were made in such a short amount of time were really inspiring as well. And I think um, having John Horgan as our premier, an NDP premier, um, be Premier of the province at this time when the province is mourning and the province has memories and there are these, um, you know, rituals for being able to honour the life and celebrate the life of somebody like Dave Barrett. Um, it just, somehow it just seemed to be the right timing, the way that it, the way yeah. that it happened. So I, w I felt really honoured to be there. And I saw a lot of people from my community there as well. A lot of people who I know have, um, you know, have done volunteering in the community, as well as local leaders, mayors from my community. Um, you know, this was really recognizing a great leader, someone who made such an impact on our province and really deserved that tribute and recognition. Yeah. And I remember, um, you know, spending a lot of time in my community, door knocking, for example, a lot of people in my community have stories about Dave Barrett because, of I course, his, you know, a, his, a lot of his family live in in our community. Um, and so one time we were at this house and uh, these guys, um, you know, we were chatting to them about the election coming up. And uh, these guys were telling a story of when De Dave Barrett had been door knocking many, many years ago, of course. So this was their big story. They brought out, you know, at the dinner table <laughs> and when people came around and things, they met Dave Barrett. And when he came around, he shared a beer with them and he shared stacking wood with them and <laughs> was a real genuine person, a genuine guy. And of course, the person I was with doing door knocking turned around and said, oh, yeah, that's my granddad. <laughs> they were, wow. <laughs> so, they were so, so now that's their new story is, well, we had this story about Dave Barrett and now we have this other story about Dave Barrett and his and his grandson. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, well, we've got a couple more minutes and I, I wanted to get to a couple of the events that are coming up. One's happening tomorrow and it will have occurred by the time that this uh, airs. It, um, what What is tomorrow for those? So tomorrow is International Women's Day. Mm -hmm. um, there's actually a whole series of events celebrating. It feels to me like it's a, it's a whole week, which is which is great because there's so much to say about International Women's Day, um, and it's still really important. I mean, we see the campaigns like Me Too, Times Up, and the theme this year for International Women's Day is Push for Progress, which you know sends that strong message of yes, we've made progress. You know, I mean, look, we have you know in, in the province of BC, 50% of our cabinet is women. But as I said earlier on, we still need to continue addressing the imbalance and the discrimination that we do see exists in so many different ways that affects women and girls um, in our province and across the world. Absolutely. Um, and also for the people in your community, they have something to look forward to. I understand you have a telephone town hall coming up. I, um, I have it here as Tuesday, March 27th at 7 p.m. March 27th, 7 p.m. Yes, it's a phone in town hall mm -hmm. um, and information is available from my office and also on my website yeah okay great well I'm sure that your the people in your community can look forward to hearing more about that I hope they do I hope they engage I really look forward to talking to people about the budget and hearing from them absolutely well unfortunately we're out of time okay. and there's so much more that we could have talked about thank you so much again for coming today thank you Joanna we've been talking today with the MLA for Esquimalt Machos and Mitzi Dean I'm your host, Joanna Groves, and we will see you next time on Constituency Report on Shaw TV.